Check, check, one, two, three. <laughs> so, the way that all of the effects sort of cut off or end and then leave space for this fill right before the drop, this is the really key trick here. That little section right there. Sometimes I will spend days just working on that little section, but if you execute that part effectively, you can sell whatever the drop is that you're going into. So the better the, the suspense and the better the, you know, the signal is that something big is coming, the more people will believe that, that big thing when they hear it. So. Yeah, this is just a, it's actually a square wave that I filtered down. And the reason that I do this sometimes is because square waves can hit a lot harder than sines or triangles if you're trying to do a sub thing. I'll use a square and then put a, put a low pass filter on it so that, you know, it's just a sub and that's the sub. Uh, actually, more often than not, if I'm using just a plain sub, it it generally is a square wave. The issue of the harmonics of square waves brings up a whole other conversation. It can sort of pop out major frequencies, major harmonics, while you're trying to do something minor. So oftentimes what I'll do is I will put a very narrow EQ on that major frequency of the bass tone. So I can hear that major, let me find it. The frequency is going to be different for each note of the bass line. Each note is putting out different major harmonic frequencies. I'm going to have to knock down each one of those. So what I'll have is something that looks like this. Then I'll copy that over and do, you know, do another one. And uh, <laughs> Every bass hit, I will find the major harmonic out of that, out of that note and then notch it out. And that way the bass line goes up. But, yeah, square subs can be problematic, but it can be worth going to all that trouble. I do this on almost all of my vocals every time, which is record a higher octave of the vocal to layer over it. Um, if I don't record a higher octave, then I'll take the vocal and transpose it up an octave and layer that back on top of itself. It adds a, a nice energy. And where I got that from was actually Earth, Wind & Fire, like many, many years ago. That's higher octave here. Here's the harmony. And the main. Layer them all on top of each other. I use it just to accentuate sort of the peak Emo emotion point of the vocal, where he says, it adds a whole other layer of energy over that when people hear it. <laughs> it's a funny answer. What my approach is to, to starting a new idea. Up until this year, I would sit down in the studio, just banging away on whatever, like drums or keys, just start fucking around until something sounds cool. What I have been doing um, the past few months is <laughs> I go out in my backyard by the pool and I sit by the pool, I close my eyes or just like look up at the sky and like try and literally imagine a song or like what I think the future is and what I want to make in my head. And I realize this is sort of a weird abstract thing, but yeah, what I do now is I go outside, sit by the pool and imagine songs before I come in and try and make them. And then when I come in, I have like a vision and I, I don't write anything now without having a vision first for what I'm going to write. Not always the same number. It's not always the same cue here. It's not always the same um, slope. Uh, sometimes it's, it's barely doing anything at the very bottom there. Sometimes it's, you know, it can be up as far as like maybe 29, 30 dB. That's about as high as I'll put my, my cutoff for the high pass, whatever it is. Um, I also do the same on the highs um, on every master, not at the same point and not 
not the same way every time, but I always do roll off the very, very, very high highs and the very, very, very low lows. Um, and depending on which EQ you do that with, it has a huge effect on the rest of the, the material too. There's a little bump here at about 15K. This is very common for me. Uh, I do find myself bumping the treble on most masters um, by at least one or two dB. And it's usually between like, anywhere from like 11K to maybe 16K, which is a pretty big range up there. It really depends on the material once again. Looks like on this song, I cut off the high frequency. It was at like 15, 15K, 15.5. So between 15 and 16K. I do cut the low end on, on kicks and bass too most of the time. It's amazing how much ultra low frequency content in, in like kick drums and basses and stuff that you have to notch out to get a good master. Kick drums, you gotta be real careful. For me, the two problem areas is there's one around 250 hertz. Um, it's kind of a knock in the kicks. Um, there's one at, right around in the middle at like 500 hertz, 550, 600. Um, and then there's another frequency around like 120, between 110 and 125 um, that's also problematic. So depending on the kick drum, the, the kick sample, um, I always end up EQing out one or more of those frequencies, like 110, 120, 250, and then like 500, 600 can all be problematic for me. I am automating the volume of the master, and I do this on every single song. Like, I automate the volume of the master. Um, so this is something I do. If you go to the very end of the song here, by the time you get to the end of the song, we're at plus 0.21. The last drop, I will bump up the volume on the master, like maybe 0.3 to 0.5 dB, just so that the song keeps getting louder, like subliminally louder as you listen to it. Um, and I also, so I lower the volume on all of my breakdowns on the master. Um, and then I automate a little line here right before the drop where it all comes up. So from here, the, the breakdown is minus 1.1. 1.74 it's that's about right usually my breakdowns are about minus two and then right before the drop it just does this little like um, and then now it goes through one final limiter i still use l2s on my master i'll have this one first doing like one or two db ducking and then a fab filter l2 and have that one doing maybe like 1.5 2db too. Yeah.